Welcome to our second edition of Patriots Podium, a regular podcast of the New York State Conservative Party. I'm Jerry Kassar, the state chairman of the Conservative Party. Today, I'm very excited to have Allison Esposito joining us. As you know, Allison was our candidate for lieutenant governor on the Lee Zeldin ticket for governor. Allison literally did, did an amazing job. She brought so much energy to our ticket. And I think you, everyone that is listening recognizes the fact that the Zeldin Esposito ticket was one of the most energized, hardworking uh, statewide tickets we have had in some time. And the results showed. We came up a little short, but at the same time, they carried into office many, many people. And we are still, we're still working off that excitement. So Allison spent a career in the NYPD leaving the service as a deputy inspector commanding a major Brooklyn police precinct, really not that far from where I live. And just so you get a sense, these police precincts could have 250, 300 police officers. In. And Allison was in command of a, one of the city's largest police precincts. Along the way, Allison served with distinction in many different policing roles. Thank you for joining us, Allison. Well, thank you so much for having me, Chairman. I, I appreciate it very much, and I'm looking forward to this. I think these podcasts are a great idea to <clears throat> keep people engaged and really get the facts out there and, and, and make sure that we're reaching our target audience and keeping the voters aware of the, the major issues that are affecting us. So thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Let me ask you, I think this is a good way to start off. Um, you clearly, I mean, I could tell, I, I, I move around the state and I, I was moving around at a snail's pace compared to what Allison and Lee were doing. I mean, Allison could literally be everywhere Lee was, but she could also be in five other spots, it seemed, <laughs> or during the same day. And I, I mean, maybe she, could, maybe she knows how many places she visited. It literally had to have been thousands. But having said that, how did you find the overall experience? In a word? humbling. It was, it was absolutely humbling. Yes, you're, you're a thousand percent correct. I felt like I was everywhere. 62 counties in New York state. And I often said, um, if I ever get the bright idea to do this again, it'll be like a small place like Rhode Island because New York <laughs> is incredibly large, but it was a wonderful experience. I could find myself on Long Island uh, shooting a commercial in the morning and then jumping on a plane to head to to Buffalo to give a speech to fly back to Long Island that same night to drive out to Suffolk County, Long Island um, to, to do another speech. So it was everywhere. But to answer your question, the humbling part of it was traveling up and down New York State and looking into the eyes of the voters, looking into the eyes of the people that live here holding their hands sometimes. Sometimes their eyes had tears in them that they were fighting back. Looking at me saying, you and Lee are our only hope. Our children cannot afford to live in New York, so they are leaving. I will not see my grandchildren raised here. We can't afford to harvest our crops. They are regulating farms. They're over-regulating farms. There's an attack on energy. They, are, we, they were stewards of their lands and they couldn't, even, they couldn't even farm appropriately. They were upset, they were scared, and they were looking to us for help. So the experience was amazing because I never thought I would leave my New York City Police Department. I loved my cops more than my next breath of air. But what I took on alongside Lee Zeldin was the plight of the everyday innocent New Yorker that just wanted to go about their daily life, take care of their family, work, provide for their family, make decisions that are best for their children, their home, their family. And we took on that plight. So it was an amazing experience. But I, I think I took some of every New Yorker that I met along the way with me on this on this journey. Well, thank you, Allison. Just as an aside, uh, of course, I often um, interacted with you in the city where there were um, members of the off-duty or on-duty members of the service around. The one thing I picked up on extremely early was 
you were you are and I guess still are an immensely popular at the time member and now former member of the NYPD. Whether it was chiefs or or lieutenants or rank and file uh, men and women of the force, they really they really responded extraordinarily well to you. And it, it wasn't about you being a Republican. They knew you. They knew you better than we knew you at that point, and we were getting to know you. You just have something about you that earns respect. And I, I respect the NYPD. So when I look at someone there that is showing respect for someone else, that just takes it to a higher level, I might point out. So thank you for your service, Allison. Well, I appreciate that very much, sir. Uh, my my officers, you know, Joe Esposito, uh, one of the chiefs, he used to call them the grunts. The grunts are the guys and gals that go out every day and don that uniform and put themselves in harm's way. If I was respected or uh, popular or, or liked, it was because I understood the severity of each and every cop that went out on that street. <clears throat> and I worked for them more than they work for me. And I had no problem standing shoulder to shoulder with them, doing anything that I would ask of them myself. I love my cops and and, and if if what you say is true and that's what you picked up on, I, I appreciate that very much. It means so much to me. Well, you're, you're welcome and it, and, and it is true. Uh, by the way, the Joe Esposito she referenced was the chief of the department, not a member of her family, however, her father was the commanding chief of Manhattan, a different Esposito, but once again, a chief Esposito. And I can tell you that does create some confusion <laughs> because her father operated and was at the same level in a sense among the department as uh, chief of department Esposito just served in a somewhat different role. You just, you just come out of a, a great world, Allison, a great world. <laughs> Yes, I, uh, I did. I followed in my father's footsteps. Uh, I joined the force because very early on, and I said this as I traveled the state, very early on, he instilled within me the drive and the passion of service and the, no the notion that those who cannot protect themselves deserve to be protected. So I, I did. I followed in, in. I had some very large shoes to fill. Uh, he was uh, an incredibly respected chief and and. There were articles written about him at times referencing him as a leader who ruled with an iron fist, but wore, wearing a velvet glove, which I always I, I always really um, kind of loved that. Uh, no, that. So that 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 does sound like a, a good characterization, something you'd want to live by. Let me ask you this. Uh, do you stay in touch with Lee? Yes, absolutely. Are you kidding me? This journey. <laughs> I didn't mean to insult you. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't insult, but Lee is like, <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 I consider myself, maybe, uh, maybe he doesn't, but I consider myself a part of the family. I, I mean, uh, his dad and stepmom and I got along so well and Diana and the girls, I, the girls are so special to me. I, Lee is, is absolutely like a brother to me. And after going through this, you don't go into battle with someone. You don't, you don't step into this arena with someone and fight side by side, shoulder to shoulder for what's right and, and bring your passion, your energy and, and then walk away and, and, and leave your, your brother. Um, so no, I, 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 I foresee a very long future uh, with Lee and I together in some capacity. I, I do absolutely stay in touch with him. Yeah, I, I, as one who's experienced a lot of... Uh... A lot of people in politics, a lot of uh, interactions. I must say that, uh, I mean, you two, when you were, a, a, which often happened, appear together, you could be introducing him, he could be commenting on you. Um, it was very natural. I know it was very sincere. See, you're really, uh, you might have been now immersed in politics for a period of time now and have an interest in where your politics can bring you and helping people, but you're not really, in my view, what we run into all too often in uh, politics, which eventually becomes a little bit disappointing to many of the uh, political activists. You are um, much more unique in that you've traveled through politics very comfortably, 
but you don't come across as being a politician. And that just is what Lee is about, too, I, I feel. So let's please yeah. uh, take that as a compliment. I mean it as. I, I do. And I thank you very much. I do take that as a compliment. I, I, I often say I have decided to change paths and go into government, but I will never be a politician. Um, my job is service to the people in some capacity. And it was very genuine, the relationship with Lee, because he is also like that. See, I right. got to know Lee in the beginning based on his policy and based on his views. And we were put together and it was we our, our, our views were akin and the way we wanted to fight for New York was, was very similar. But as I traveled the campaign trail with him, I got to know Lee the man, a man of empathy, a man of compassion, a man of honor, a man with passion to serve, a soldier, a fighter. And I, it was very natural, didn't matter who was introducing who or who was speaking to who, our relationship was, was cemented very early on and it just continued to grow stronger. I respect him. And I think that's what you what you see coming through. Yes, I, I agree with you. Let me ask you this: It does seem that the governor and the legislature learned uh, nothing from last year's election. I think crime, the economy, spending, taxes continue to go in the wrong direction. Uh, I think I would assume this is very frustrating for you. Um, the governor is really weak, and the legislature really does pretty much anything they want. Are the Socialist Democrats running Albany these days? <laughs> yes, without a doubt. And frustrating to say the least. Kathy Hochul is weak. She is no leader. She doesn't speak out when it's necessary. She doesn't take care of her people. She is not doing the job that New Yorkers need her to do. Government's number one job is to protect its people. And then you know what, sir? Get the hell out of our lives. Right. That is what government should be there for. She has meddled or the socialists have pushed her to meddling in the everyday life of each and every New Yorker, whether it's how they harvest their crop on their farm or what school they send their children to or what type of energy they can use in their homes. And she's going farther and farther and farther to the left. And New Yorkers, they're, they are beyond their breaking point. This is, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. They learned nothing from the last election. They didn't have to, you know, they, they won. And it didn't matter that 50% or, or, or a very close margin, 47% uh, of New Yorkers wanted this change. It didn't matter to her because she's got her four more years and now she has a blank check to do whatever she wants to stay in power. The, the socialists of Albany and Kathy Hochul don't subscribe to the methodology of putting people before power. And they are struggling to stay in power, do what's good for thee, not for me. Um, and and it's it's at a cost. It's at a huge cost to everyday New Yorkers. And it's, it's more than frustrating. It's criminal. Well, I will, I, I will say, you know, it was like 48, 49%. And um, I mean, as, as everyone knows, that was the best we've done since uh, the Pataki days. Uh, states changed a lot. Um, frankly speaking, some of your votes have moved out of the state. They've moved mm -hmm. to Florida or, or they moved in, you know, South Carolina. They're just not here. Um, and I think in that environment, you would have certainly won. But... I, I feel, and I, you know, Lee, as you know, is, is, and you obviously are too, is continuing along a path of, of communicating with a much larger uh, sway of New Yorkers of, than we have done in many years. I mean, he, he did, you, you, the ticket did exceptionally well in parts of New York City, where I live in South Brooklyn. Uh, the Republican conservative parties had many, many, many wins. I would actually say South Brooklyn is a red area of New York State right now, and it is Brooklyn. And that was without question um, on the backs of the of the ticket. I mean, you guys put together. You and Lee were in South Brooklyn. I'll be honest with you. I would bet you twenty five or thirty times 
I mean, you'd, you'd be driving through and you would stop just because you couldn't drive through the area without stopping. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I, I, let me ask you this, Allison. You're, you're following, and I know participating in what Lee's doing. Do you feel that some of these emerging uh, communities are going to begin to lock themselves in for Republican voters as, as long as we keep on giving them good candidates? So I think it is largely about the candidates. Um, I think that, that the American people are waking up and it's not really about a party. It's about a person and it's about a policy. And, you know, it's it, Democrats and Republicans, they used to they used to maybe disagree on how to get there. But the end goal was still what was best for the country. Right. Uh, now you're seeing a party uh, on the, the severe left that it's not. It, it, you know, you have a leader and I use that term very lightly in Joe Biden that, I mean, he's frankly, he's compromised. You know, he's in bed with communist China. He has, he's refusing to secure our border. There's nothing for the American people that comes out of his administration. It's just devastation. So I think a lot of these places, plus I want to be honest when we say that like Republicans for a long time, we kind of didn't do it right. And I think we're waking up to that as well. You have areas and let's just take new york city for 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 this um argument stake you have areas in new york city that the democrats don't visit because they take their vote for for you know just for granted they don't need to go visit there they don't need to look at them they don't need to talk to them they don't need to hear their problems they know what's best for them and republicans never went into those areas because they said hey i'm never going to get their vote well you know what that's not true and I went into, listen, these are the communities that I served for 25 yeah. years. I went into communities in Brooklyn, communities in the Bronx, communities in Manhattan, communities in Queens that traditionally had never seen a Republican walk through and had conversations with these people and listened to what their plight was, listened to what their issues were, addressed them when I could. And then, you know what, when we, when we disagreed on something, we, we were able to have a conversation about it. Isn't that a unique idea? agreeing to disagree. But the, the fact that these communities now are on our map, I think you're going to see a change because it's not the traditional, that Democratic Party is not the same as what it once, once was. It apologizes for the progressive socialist party apologizes for the greatest country in the history of the world. And people are waking up to that. And it doesn't matter what race, religion, gender, it doesn't matter who you are or where you live. Everyone wants to improve their children's life Then, on, based on theirs. They all want their children to be able to go to school and learn effectively and be safe. And they want to be able to provide food for their family. And they want to be able to be independent of government. And this is what people want. And the more we, we show them that, the more I think you're going to see these areas change. Well, you two uh, certainly helped us uh, carry that change right through to assembly races and certainly congressional races and some state senate races around the state. So thank you for that. So Teddy Roosevelt famously spoke of the man in the arena. I want to paraphrase his, uh, well, it's really the first part of his quote. Um, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again. Is Lee Zeldin that person? Are you that person? Was the Zeldin Esposito ticket those people? Absolutely. That is absolutely one of my favorite quotes. It's, it's funny that you mine, bring it Mine up. too, mine too. <laughs> really, I adore it. In fact, I, I don't know if you remember, but but my I guess my right and my left hand, two of my very close um, campaign staffers, Luke and Jack, um, mm -hmm. actually sent me after the uh, campaign was over, they sent me uh, an American flag with a blue line and inscribed in this large wooden piece is that quote with a note that said, Allison, we left it all on the field. So answer your question, yes. Um, I, I stepped out of my comfort zone. Lee stepped out of his comfort zone to, to walk into an arena 
that especially to me was completely foreign. And we did it not for our own gain, but for the, the, the good and decent, hardworking people of New York State. And I don't plan on walking out of that arena until the country and the state are better off for having known us. And it, you know what? We do fall short. We do fall. Uh, we, we are not always going to be successful in our endeavors, but if you learn from them and you use them as stepping stones, then they are successes. So I'm not leaving anytime soon. No, I, I strongly agree with you. So let me ask you this. Uh, you, do you think you may at some point in the future run for office again? Well, nothing is off the table. Um, I have taken some um, some very high profile meetings and, and I'm, I'm definitely in conversations with different people around not only the state, but around the country um, to answer that question. What happened in this shift from law enforcement to going into the, the or walking into the door of government with me is a commitment. I went everywhere in the state, traveled up and down the state, 62 counties, talked to New Yorkers from all locations. And I committed to that I would fight for them, that I would be the voice to the voiceless, that I would speak on their behalf, that their main issues would become my main issues. And I committed to them just because I fell short in the arena doesn't change that commitment. So I am absolutely considering there's a number of races that are on the table um but i am committed to continuing to serve the people of the state and the people of the united states of america so there there is definitely a large possibility a large probability that you will see my name on a ballot again soon well i'll say this uh, the conservative party is immensely proud of you as i think i've indicated uh we would um uh... I think I speak for everybody when I would say we would encourage you to do exactly what you just stated. I, I know we would very, very much enjoy having you on our ballot line at a future date. So thank you for that. Alice, let me ask you this. Uh, can you give us some concluding uh, words for our audience? Um, uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, we don't run the show beyond like a half an hour. So I'd like to see if you have some concluding words. Well, I, I guess what I would say to your listeners and your viewers is the silent majority is awake, not woke, but awake. Mm -hmm. And we are coming for our state and we are coming for our country back, but it's going to take each and every one of us. We have to get out. We have to take it upon ourselves to get involved. We have to speak to everyone from both sides of the aisle. Even Sally down the block, who I often mentioned that you don't like. We need to start having the difficult conversations. We need to come to rescue our country. The fact is, the silent majority was busy for the last generation or so, putting their kids in school, going to work, and providing for their families. And while we were doing that, we missed what was going on on the left. And... We're awake now, and you, you can say with darkness comes light. Even in the pandemic, the, the children were taken out of schools horribly. They were, they were away from their friends and teachers. It was absolutely horrific, but they were on Zoom calls. Yeah. And the parents heard what was going on in those schools. And you know, mom was in the kitchen like, what, did, what just came out of that computer? So again, with darkness comes light, we are awake. And I would encourage your viewers and your listeners to get involved. Local elections, school board elections, it doesn't matter. Conversations, donations, you know, volunteering. It's going to take all of us. It's not just the candidate. I can't do it without each and everyone's help and support. No candidate can be successful. So in order for us to really come rescue our state and our country, we have to do it together. Well, thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, thank you very much for today and sharing your insights. Uh, we really do look forward to having you run for office uh, in the future. And we also look forward to having you on a future episode of uh, 
of this ongoing uh, podcast. Absolutely. I look forward to it as well. I enjoyed myself thoroughly today. It was wonderful to reconnect with you and again, to reach out to your viewers. And I also want to say to each and every person who's listening, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you did throughout our campaign, the support, the volunteers, the donations, just even the prayers and the well wishes. Thank you for all of your support. There were a lot of prayers. I'm going to tell you that right now. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Katie Mahone and Andrew Davis, who worked together to produce this show. And for our listeners, uh, thank you for uh, uh, tuning in to today's episode. I hope you will join us for our next episode where we're going to have Alan Roth who's the president of Secure America, is going to join us to discuss border security and the migrant crisis. Thanks again for joining us. And if you enjoy today's episode, subscribe uh, wherever you're listening and give us a five-star rating. Until next time, I'm Jerry Kassar, and this is the Patriots Podium Podcast. Thank you.